Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to commence proceedings of the 16th annual Sujata Jayawardena Memorial Oration, hosted by the Alumni Association of the University of Colombo. This is the first Sujata Jayawardena Memorial Oration that is being conducted completely virtually, and we are happy to announce that we have over 1,000 participants giving this oration at this moment through Zoom and Facebook Live. Moving away this year from a physical oration, we will not have formal ceremonial procession, which would comprise of the Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo, the President of the Alumni Association, deans, professors, senior members of the academic community, and the other office bearers and members of the Alumni Association, who would have traditionally led the orator, Professor Nirika Malavige, to the ceremonial hall. Instead, we now present a short video clip on the Sujata Jawadan memorial orations that have been held in the past. The annual Sujata Jawadan oration was commenced in 2004 as the brainchild of then alumni president, Mr. Tilak Karunaratna, to recognize the immense services rendered by alumni president, the late Mrs. Sujata Jawadan. Since the inaugural oration conducted in 2004 and with 15 orations held over the years, the Sujata Jayawardhan Memorial Oration has become an important feature in the annual calendar of the University of Colombo, where a topic of contemporary relevance and importance is presented by an expert in the area. The inaugural Sujata Jayawardhan Memorial Oration was delivered in 2004 by Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe on the topic, Are We Alone in the Universe? A Social Scientific Analysis. The second oration, which was in 2005, was by Mr. Jayanta Dhanapala, who spoke on Peace and Development in Sri Lanka. The third oration, held in 2006, was delivered by His Excellency Robert O. Blake Jr. on the United States and Sri Lanka Mutual Strategies in Development and Security. In 2007, the fourth oration was delivered by Judge C.J. Viramantri on Traditional Global Wisdom on Environmental Protection. The fifth oration, which was in 2008, was by Vidya Jyoti Professor Arjuna Aluvihara on the topic, Universities, Doctors and Society. Mr. Lalit Viratunga delivered the sixth Sujata Jayavadhan Memorial Oration in 2009 on the topic, Education, Where Do We Go From Here? The seventh oration was delivered by His Excellency Gotabe Rajapaksa in 2010 on Development Plan for the City of Colombo. Honorable Mahinda Samar Singha delivered the 8th oration in 2011 on Human Rights, International Challenges for Sri Lanka. In 2012, Dr. P.B. Jayasundara delivered the 9th oration on Challenges in Formulating the National Budget for 2013. Professor Sudarshan Seniviratna delivered the oration in 2013 on the topic Heritage Odyssey Sri Lanka, a visual narration unfolding the multifaceted personality of an island civilization. The 11th oration was by Professor Emeritus Carlo Fonseca in 2014 on the topic Religion, Philosophy and Science. In 2015, the 12th oration was delivered by Honorable Ranil Vikramasinghe on Strengthening Democratic Institutions. His Excellency Yi Ziang Ling delivered the 13th oration in 2017 on One Belt, One Road, Sri Lanka-China Relations. The 14th oration was delivered by High Commissioner His Excellency Taranjit Singh Sandhu in 2018 on Sabka Sat Sabka Vikas, Together We Progress, India-Sri Lanka Relations in the Light of India's Neighbourhood First Policy. Mr. Tony Veerasingh had delivered the 15th oration in 2019 on the topic Up in the Cloud, Using Artificial Intelligence and Digitalization to Transform Sri Lanka to a Developed Country. 
And today we look forward to hearing the 16th Sujata Jayawardena Memorial Oration by Professor Neelika Malavige on the topic the COVID-19 pandemic the way forward through impactful research. The following persons will now take their seats at the virtual head table. The orator of the 16th Sujata Jayawardena Memorial Oration, Professor Neelika Malavike, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo, Senior Professor Chandrika N. Vijayaratna, the President of the Alumni Association of the University of Colombo, Mr. Rajiv Amarasurya. I now call upon the President of the Alumni Association, Mr. Rajiv Amarasurya, to speak a few words of welcome. Thank you, Rwandi. I ordered to this evening, Professor Nirika Malavige, the Chancellor of the University of Colombo, Reverend, Reverend Oswald Gomez, Vice Chancellor, Senior Professor Chandrika N. Vijayaratna, former Vice Chancellors, past auditors of the Sushyatha Shahabod Innovation, past presidents of the association, members of the Council and Senate, deans, the registrar, and members of the academic staff, members of the, of the family of the late Mrs. Sujata Chayapodhana, distinguished invitees, alumni, ladies and gentlemen. I extend a very warm welcome to all of you attending the 16th annual Sujata Chayapodhana Memorial Oration of the University of Colombo. This is the first oration which is being conducted completely virtually and I'm informed that we have over 1,000 participants connecting presently through Zoom and Facebook Live. We initially had our concerns to convert this very formal and symbolic oration into the virtual format. But with continuing uncertainties, we decided that we will take the virtual path and we have thereby been able to reach out to a much wider audience today. We're very pleased to welcome our distinguished orator, Professor Nilika Malavige, the head of the Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine, the University of Sri Jayapadanapura, and of course, a proud alumnus of the University of Colombo. Today's oration is on the very timely topic, the COVID-19 pandemic, the way forward through impactful research. This topic is very close to our hearts and the very being of all of us, with Sri Lanka having already lost 8,775 persons due to this deadly virus. Before proceeding any further, let us observe a moment of silence in memory of all those who have lost their lives, both in Sri Lanka and the world, due to this pandemic. Thank you. I do not need to reiterate that we are in very trying times, and this is now especially so for Sri Lanka, which not only has to face these daily deaths, and rising numbers of COVID positive cases, but also to manage a crippling economy and huge external debt obligations. Further, one does not need to do too much analysis to conclude that mistakes have been made and things could have been managed better. But what is pertinent is that every country has made mistakes time and again in dealing with this pandemic. And everyone from the most developed of nations is learning to manage this pandemic on the run. What is important in crises like this is to take a step back out of the nitty gritty of the daily and weekly issues, move away from the dance floor and get onto the balcony, so to speak, and think afresh and reassess the situation. It is in this context that we decided on the today's topic. And there is presently no better person than Professor Neelika Malvige to present this oration. When we invited Professor Malavige for today's oration, I did not know too much about her except for her exceptional contribution made during this time. But on a personal note, I was later happy to become aware that she is in fact the sister of a classmate of mine from school days. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation and we do look forward to your presentation this evening. Before I conclude, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge in appreciation the individuals who have been instrumental in the success and continuity of this memorial oration over the past decade and a half. 
Whilst the idea of, the memo of this memorial oration was first conceived by past president and council member, Mr. Tilak Karunaratna, during his presidency in 2004, over the past 17 years, he, together with his successor, past president, Mr. Ramani Amrasuria, have provided leadership in, in holding this event, bolstered by the unsinted support of our senior committee member, Mr. J.M.S. Bandara, and the other members of the alumni. I must also take this opportunity to thank our Vice Chancellor, Senior Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna, who has been a tower of strength and support to the alumni for all the encouragement and support given. In fact, today's orator was a suggestion made by the Vice Chancellor, and also she being someone who sees the importance of, and is passionate about research, was very involved in the formulation of the topic for today. In conclusion, I would like to thank all of you for your presence this evening and look forward to the 16th Sujata Chavadana memorial oration to be short, delivered shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. May I now call upon the Vice Chancellor, Senior Professor Chandrika and Vijay Ratna to address us and also to introduce the orator. Thank you. Chancellor, Your Grace, former Vice Chancellors, Rector Deans and Directors, our President, past Presidents and members of the Executive Committee of the Alumni Association of the University of Colombo, Registrar, Acting Librarian, Bursa, and our respected members of the Council, senior professors and professors and academics, along with the heads of the departments and members of the technical and administrative staff, members of all, presidents and members of all other alumni associations linked to our university, distinguished invitees, students of the University of Colombo and other universities, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure and privilege to be a co-host of this activity, the most important event, the calendar event of our leading alumni group and uh, remembering a very respected lady who was also my teacher. The daughter of the most respected and valued clinicians of our and products of our own university. She's also the wife of Dr. Lasanta Malavike, another valued alumnus who has been the wind beneath her wings and has made the University of Colombo so proud. And she's no doubt an inspiration for our young researchers, students, and teachers alike. Currently, the professor and head of the Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine at the University of Sri Jayadanapura, she was appointed the director of the Center for Dengue Research of the University of Sri Jayadanapura in 2012, a post she has held continuously for the and with six distinctions, five gold medals, top of the results of that year in the year 2000. She holds the MRCP, the D. Phil Oxon, which was funded through a Commonwealth scholarship. And she's also a fellow of the Royal Colleges of Physicians, as well as Pathologists of the UK, and an associate fellow of Higher Education Academy of the UK. She has won numerous awards, ladies and gentlemen, not only from our medical school, but also from the prestigious orations and gold medals from the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Ceylon College of Physicians, the Allergy and and Immunology Association, and the list goes on, including one of the 10 Outstanding Young Persons Award for Medical Research in 2011, as well as the Third World Academy of Science Young Scientist Award in 2012. She has received the Presidential Award for Research continuously ever since 2006 for 12 consecutive years, and she has an innumerable number of publications. Technical advisory group for COVID-19, while also having been an executive committee member of the International Society for Infectious Diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, the real measure of education is not the names, the degrees or certificates held or displayed, and not the number of grants, projects, papers, orations, or citations, but to be an 
intellectual who personifies the values, attitudes, behavior, and contributions to mankind. And in this respect, there is no better person to honor the late Sujata Jayawardena than Neelika Malavike. So over to you, Neelika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madam. Uh, uh, Vice Chancellor, University of uh, Colombo, Senior Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna, uh, President of the Alumni Association, Mr. Rajiv Amarasurya, former President of the Alumni Association, Mr. Tilak Karna Ratna, uh, Council members, members of the Senate, academic staff members, non academic staff members, ladies and gentlemen. I consider it as an absolute honor and privilege to be invited to deliver the 16th memorial oration of late Mrs. Sujata Jayavadana. Late Mrs. Sujata Jayavadana was one of the most inspiring and exceptional women who has earned the undying gratitude of many generations of female students at the University of Colombo for building of the University Women's Hostel. She was dearly loved by people of all walks of life and people were engulfed in her flowing river of kindness. She never harbored any negative thoughts and one of her life lessons that she taught her mentees was that fame passes. Prepare for the time when others take your place. Be happy at all times, regardless of great name or great fortune, for they are illusionary. She epitomizes as the ideal woman and mother. I consider it as the biggest honor to uh, deliver this oration, the first woman to deliver this oration uh, in the memory of this extraordinary human being. From the beginning uh, of human history, which is when we first evolved from the great ape and the human species became, humans have been infected by many infectious diseases. However, during hunter-gatherer times, when there was hardly any contact between tribes, when a tribe was infected with a pathogen, it was not passed on to the other tribe and therefore pandemics did not exist. However, as our human population spread across the globe and international travel increased, when a pathogen infected humans in a particular location, it spread like wildfire, causing pandemics. Throughout the human history, there have been numerous pandemics killing millions of human beings. However, two pandemics are noteworthy because they resulted in deaths of around 50 million people uh, worldwide. The first such pandemic was Black Death, which was from 1346 to 1353, uh, killing about 25 million in Europe which is about 30% of the European population and also around 25 to 75 million in Asia. Then the next such biggest pandemic, uh, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, is the Spanish flu caused by the influenza virus occurring in 1918 to 1920. This resulted in around 50 million deaths and about 500 million individuals in the world that is one third of the world population was infected. So actually the Spanish flu killed more individuals than World War I and World War II combined. So that is the devastation that pandemics can cause. Since 1920, although we did have pandemics, they did not result in devastation of that magnitude uh, because of uh, invention of so many vaccines and the availability of safe and effective antibiotics. Okay, so in, in 2019, December, when we saw this uh, unusual virus infection emerging in China, killing so many uh, Ch Chinese individuals, this mysterious viral infection, late, uh, later known as SARS-CoV-2, I think at that moment, none of us thought that it would evolve and spread around the world and become what it is today. However, uh, it, it spread around the world rapidly, and even the big, world's richest countries with the best resources uh, were very badly affected. And uh, this is a picture from uh, New York Central Park. And because the New York health system was overwhelmed, they had to put up 
uh, tents in the Central Park to accommodate the uh, increased uh, numbers of uh, patients. And last March 2020, we watched in horror as the Italian hospitals were overwhelmed and hundreds of people died every day. And in the UK, uh, in the second wave, which was from 2020 November to 21, 2021 February, UK recorded the highest death rates in the world uh, so far with about 18 million deaths uh, per, per, per million individuals. However, although tw uh, in 2020, the pandemic mainly affected European countries, most of the Asian countries did not uh, were not affected to that extent. And many of the Asian countries were congratulating themselves about how well they are doing. For instance, India uh, in uh, February this year, uh, this is a news appearing on the 22nd of February states, not only did India keep running a successful fight against COVID, but it set an example in front of the world for what work can be done during COVID. But of course, the celebration was short-lived. As we know later, uh, the Delta whale en engulfed India, killing so many individuals. And although India officially recorded more than 414,000 deaths, uh, later research showed that actually 4 million Indians perished in this Delta wave. And since then, of course, Delta has spread around the globe and continues to cause devastation in 2021, the year we thought we would get rid of COVID-19. And from the onset of the pandemic, many scientists and global leaders recognize that when we pay, face a pandemic situation like this, we will have to collaborate or we will be eliminated. And for the first time, there was unprecedented cooperation between global scientists. There were websites and data sharing platforms where scientists from all over the world were uploading their genetic sequences so that these genomic sequences of the virus were widely available to all scientists in the world to act fast and to understand the emerging variants. The world's biggest clinical trial took off. And as a result of that biggest clinical trial, today we know that we have two effective treatments for treating patients with severe COVID. And we also know what doesn't work for COVID like hydroxychloroquine. Within less than a year, several COVID vaccines were developed and now are being used worldwide and more than a billion doses have been given to individuals everywhere. And usually when you do research, one of the major constraints is funding. But in this instance, all the global funding bodies like the WHO, UN Gates Foundation pumped in enough money, more than enough money to get on with research. And at the beginning of this pandemic, there were so many questions that we needed to answer. For instance, regarding the virus, will the virus mutate? Will such mutations affect vaccine efficacy? How fast does the virus evolve? Regarding infections, of course, why do some, only some individuals develop severe disease? What are the markers of severe disease? Is there a way we can find out who will develop severe disease? Why do individuals die of COVID-19? Once infected, can people get reinfected? How long do antibodies last for? And are other aspects of the immune system important in reducing disease severity? So everybody was scrambling to find answers to these questions. And of course, our, our laboratory had genomic sequencing facilities before the uh, COVID outbreak hit us. And thanks to Dr. Chandima Jeevandara, who was instrumental in developing these labs and uh, making sure that the infrastructures were in place, we could establish and start genomic sequencing from detection of the very first patient in Sri Lanka. And we have done so up to now. And leading world journals like Nature has highlighted our genomic sequencing, comparing our sequencing to uh, other countries in the region. And of course, we have been giving all this data, not only to the rest of the world, by uploading in the genomic uh, website I showed, but we have been sharing or giving this data to the Ministry of Health and other policymakers to make decisions and also uh, giving this information to the general public so they understand what is happening in Sri Lanka. And apart from the virus, there were many other questions to answer. For instance, 
why do only some individuals develop severe disease? Can we find certain disease markers that can predict who develops severe disease? Can we find markers so that we understand what is going on to develop drug targets? What are the immune responses like? And can we compare this COVID-19 with other infectious diseases like dengue? We had been working on dengue for a long time and, and we had clinical trials ongoing for dengue before the pandemic. So we were interested to know whether we could repurpose drugs. And because of dengue, uh, we had established very strong relationships with certain individuals and institutions uh, like Dr. Anand Vijay Vikram. We had been very closely working him, with him since 2007 and our team was visiting this hospital on a daily basis since 2014. And since we had a very strong really ongoing relationship working on dengue, it was natural for us to start using these resources to answer these very crucial questions regarding COVID-19. And of course, if you're going to do cutting research on, on COVID-19, you need to put the best brains together. And this is uh, my supervisor, Professor Graham Mogg. And although I finished my PhD in December, 2007, uh, and since it's, four, since it's 14 years, he's still my mentor and supports me in the same manner. And we had been working on dengue together for a long time. So he was here in February, 2020, before COVID hit Sri Lanka, but all of us knew it was just a matter of time. And that is when we planned all the COVID studies and applied for ethics in March itself. And uh, these studies between us and, and University of Oxford was highlighted in Oxford websites. And because of these ongoing studies, we were able to uh, obtain early funding from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office at the uh, British High Commission so that we could, uh, our studies could take off. And apart from University of Oxford, we were collaborating with many other leading uh, universities in the world, like Duke and US. And uh, I had just visited that university to expand our research on dengue. And Professor Ling Pavan and his group were already working on coronaviruses. So because of these collaborations, certain assays were available to us to use for research before they were available to the rest of the world. Soon, we, these were available to us soon after development. And we successfully used all these assays for research. And before COVID-19 came, we were doing dengue PCRs and PCRs for so many other uh, viruses. So uh, it was only natural for us to work on COVID as well and do PCRs for COVID. Initially, although we started doing PCRs for the National Institute of Infectious Diseases, also known as IDH, uh, the Sri Jayavatpur General Hospital, Kalugovil Hospital, and many other hospitals, uh, most of the outbreak that happened in the first wave and the second wave was in the Colombo Municipality Council. So we developed very strong relationships with Dr. Ruan Mijinuni and Dr. Dinu Guruge, which we continue to have. And we, with these relationships, we were able to build up on these relationships to do further studies in the community. And the findings of these initial studies showed how long antibodies last in those with mild illness compared to severe illness. And in the CMC, where we detect the largest number of cases, especially in the second wave, how many asymptomatic in, in infections were there and how many individuals got infected unknowingly. And also we were able to find disease markers of severe disease, including interleukin-6. And we know that there is a drug already used for blocking IL-6. And these research were published in uh, nature uh, journals and in other journals as well. However, these uh, early studies on uh, disease pathogenesis, we did not continue after that. The reason is uh, by this time, USA, Europe, and many developed countries were working a lot on this, uh, on this angle. And with the availability of funds uh, and, the res and their resources, we knew that they will be finding answers to these questions way before we did. So it was a waste of time if we also concentrated on the same when we knew that somebody will be coming out with the results way before us. So instead we concentrated on something very important, which is vaccine studies. And we know that new vaccines with novel technology was used for the first time in the world for COVID-19. But there were many questions regarding these vaccines. What is the duration of immunity? 
how is the immune responses in the real life compared to clinical trials? And when these vaccines were developed, we did not have any variants. So how do these vaccines work for variants? And there was very limited data in, uh, for certain vaccines like Sinopharm and Sputnik in different populations, age groups, and for variants. So it was very important that we did this research. And we know that the initially uh, the vaccines, uh, the Covishield vaccine was given to healthcare workers because they were in the priority list. So we initially studied the immune responses to the Covishield vaccine. Uh, and we have a large team of individuals working day and night, weekends, uh, so that we can generate data very fast and make this data available to the rest of the world. And these initial studies of the uh, immunogenicity of the Covishield vaccine was published in Nature Communications. However, there were other important vaccines and so many questions uh, regarding Sinopharm. For instance, a lot of people did want to know how well do people respond to these vaccines? How well does this vaccine compare with other so-called Western vaccines, such as the Covishield or AstraZeneca, Modern and Pfizer? And how are the antibody responses to Delta uh, and other SARS-CoV-2 variants in individuals who receive this vaccine? And do older people respond well? Because when the WHO approved this vaccine, they put a clause saying that the, there is not a lot of data available of, for the efficacy of this vaccine in all the individuals. So we scrambled to answer these questions. And we, had, well, we uh, had very strong relationships with the CMC. And when the CMC rolled out the Sinopharm vaccine, we were able to recruit individuals for Sinopharm studies. And we also expanded our collaborations with the University of Oxford with Professor Alan Townsend's group. They had developed antibody assays to detect antibodies to these different SARS-CoV-2 variants like alpha, beta, and delta, which were available for us to use in our, uh, all our vaccine studies. And after we analyzed all our Sinopharm vaccine data, it, uh, we put out the data initially as a preprint which is customary in the time of pandemic to make data available as soon as possible. And it received unprecedented media attention. I'm not talking about media attention in Sri Lanka, but the media attention from the rest of the world. So you can imagine how important uh, these research findings were when we were highlighted in over 43 international media outlets. And depending on which media was highlighting our research, the headlines changed. So for instance, the China Daily reported that Sri Lanka study shows Sinopharm's COVID jab very effective against the virus, including the Delta strain. Similar headlines were reported by Hong Kong and from India, but the Reuters news service reported that Sinopharm's COVID-19 shot induces weaker antibody responses to Delta, completely opposite of what the China Daily was reporting. And this led to a Twitter fight between the Chinese embassy of Sri Lanka uh, 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 exposing that the CEO of Reuters Corporation is a board member of Pfizer. So, uh, so this is the amount of attention that our research received from international media. And we know that of course from Sri Lankan mainstream media and social media. But what did we actually find? So first of all, our study, our research was not an efficacy study. So we cannot com comment on the effectiveness of this vaccine. It was a study to look at immune responses. We found that 95% of individuals developed antibodies two weeks after both doses and 89% developed neutralizing antibodies. So those are the good antibodies that protect you. And the antibody levels for Delta variant were similar to those following natural infection. But are those levels sufficient for protection? Up to now, until now, nobody in the world knows how much antibodies you need for protection. What is the level of antibodies you need for protection? Nobody knows. Those are questions even now everybody in the world is trying to find out. The vaccine also induced T cell responses which is another arm of the immune system in 27.7% of individuals. So what does this actually mean? So there are studies published in Asia showing 
that neutralizing antibody levels are highly predictive of immune protection from symptomatic infection. So the fact that 89% of individuals develop neutralizing antibodies is good news, but based on our study, it, we cannot draw conclusions about the effectiveness or the efficacy of the Sinopharm vaccine and clinical trials are required for that. Of course, with all these vaccines, there was a lot of vaccine politics. The European Union, Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand were not accepting uh, the Chinese vaccines and the Covishield, which is the same as the AstraZeneca, uh, those who received these vaccines as fully vaccinated. WHO, of course, started challenging them because the WHO had approved all these vaccines. Uh, and so this battle goes on. It will be interesting to see what happens when countries starting open, opening up, because after all, in the European U Union region, Chinese tourists are the main category of tourists. So let's see how this vaccine politics unfolds. However, the really ugly side of vaccine politics is hoarding of vaccines from developed countries. And they have ordered so much in excess that very soon these vaccines are going to expire. We are talking about 3.7 billion doses of Pfizer, 1.7 billion doses of Moderna, 1.1 billion doses of AstraZeneca, that's the large amount of vaccines that are going to be wasted uh, without being shared with the rest of the world. So I think it's really important for countries like ours, uh, where we could, I mean, we are doing an excellent program, but still obtain uh, these surplus vaccines to be used in our country. Now, of course, going forward from here, how can we use research and innovation to take us forward to win the battle against COVID-19? I think everybody knows that Sri Lanka is now in not a so good situation. We have a very high uh, death rate community and population. Our hospitals are overcrowded. Uh, we hardly have uh, adequate ICU facilities and high dependency unit. So we are in a grave situation, but how can we move forward from here? And that is the most important question that we need to answer right now. And as I just showed you at the beginning, everybody has made mistakes. This is a new virus that suddenly came out of nowhere. So the world's richest countries with the best resources made mistakes. And as a result, thousands and thousands of people died. Then countries that were congratulating themselves and were hailed as the best countries of COVID control, like Vietnam, uh, is now seeing a surge of COVID-19. For instance, yesterday, the total number of cases in Vietnam was all, almost 13,000 with deaths exceeding 300. So Vietnam, which was one of the most examples to the rest of the world, is not doing so well. So many other countries that were examples are not doing so well because everybody makes mistakes. And, but the important thing is we need to learn from these mistakes and move forward. The most important thing is to be proactive and not reactive. Perhaps in Sri Lanka, we have been more reactive uh, rather than proactive. When, the, when we see large number of cases or deaths, then we react. But we have to change our strategy if we are to move forward with COVID-19. So for instance, these two arrow shows, uh, when the uh, first outbreak, second wave Brandix cluster was declining and we opened up for the new year uh, in a very, uh, and we had a lot of tamashas. And early April, we detected something like the alpha variant, which was confirmed as the alpha variant on the 21st of April. But maybe certain measures were taken too late. We saw a rapid surge in the number of cases. And during the lockdown, we had, unfortunately, we went to a lockdown. Lockdowns of course should be the last resort, but uh, unfortunately we had to take that decision possibly. And during the lockdown, we detected the Delta variant in the community. This was by completely randomly. And given the very limited sequencing we are doing, when we detect a case of Delta in the community, we know that at least there should be 100 or 1000 more cases. But of course we relaxed, which we should do, but I wonder whether the relaxation was done in a scientific manner. And as a result of that, we are facing what we are facing today and we have been forced to go into a lockdown. So which should not be the 
right strategy. So we need to anticipate, plan, and act swiftly. There are many experts in universities and in Sri Lanka who can very effectively do modeling. They, they can predict the course of uh, the outbreak, the num how the number of cases increase, how the number of deaths increase, but we can't just take one set of uh, individuals, not just mathematical modeling experts or infectious diseases experts. We need financial forecasting experts. We need economies, because when you just take one set of people, their predictions don't involve the other sector. We know that Sri Lanka is uh, in a very grave economical situation. So when we plan strategies, we need multidisciplinary approach. So if only a particular group of experts are making recommendations, then such recommendations would be the way they see things. For instance, if infectious diseases specialists in hospital only make recommendations, they would be, see, they would be seeing what is happening in hospitals. They would no, not know the economical and financial implications of certain strategies. If epidemiologists are taking, making recommendations, they might not see exactly what is going on in hospitals and also have no idea of uh, the economical crisis. But if only financial experts are making recommendations, they would not have no idea what is going in hospitals. So all these experts should come together and sit, sit together, discuss things and make recommendations. So to take the best approach for a country like Sri Lanka. And of course, collection and dissemination of accurate data is most important. At this day and age, when technology is so developed, that cannot be very hard. There are many experts who can help for this. And we know that COVID-19 is here to stay. We cannot get rid of it. So like what we are seeing with dengue and influenza, we know that we get dengue outbreaks. And when we see dengue outbreaks are emerging, we rapidly do vector control, cleaning gardens, uh, spraying and all those activities to try and curb the outbreak. Similarly, we need absolutely accurate data to understand when and where COVID is emerging, uh, to allocate proper resources and control such outbreaks. Without accurate data, it is difficult to go, move forward. And most importantly, uh, we need this accurate data to educate the public, so win their trust so that they can be responsible. And knowing that COVID-19 is here to stay, if it was here for a month or two, maybe we can say, take drastic measures uh, where we forcefully uh, do certain actions to uh, control the pandemic. However, we know that COVID is here to stay. So we, and it's, and it's going to be endemic. It is already endemic. So we have to have sustainable uh, uh, approaches to deal with the uh, outbreaks. The key is uh, empowering the public and empowering the communities. Otherwise, without the public support or giving the responsibilities to the public, we cannot proceed. And if we take Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka has a history of dealing with uh, outbreaks. When we look at our traditional knowledge, uh, outbreaks like chickenpox and other infectious diseases have been controlled and houses which have these outbreaks hang neem leaves to alert the neighbors that there is an outbreak here uh, and undergo 14 days quarantine. We can use this traditional knowledge to move forward. However, all traditional knowledge is not the same. Uh, there could be very effective traditional medicine which can cure COVID. Similarly, there could be very good Western medicine, medicine which effectively cure COVID. However, even though it could be traditional or Western, uh, and just because it might not cause any harm, without proper scientific data, it would be wrong to recommend these for COVID treatment yeah, without uh, scientific evidence. It can come, cause more harm than do good. And I know at this moment, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama is carrying out uh, two clinical trials for traditional medicine and also for Western medicine. I am also involved in them. And we need properly conducted scientific trials to find out effective medicine for COVID-19. And the only way forward are vaccines. So we need to vaccinate as many as possible, as fast as possible. But we know there is a significant proportion of over 60 individuals and over 30 individuals 
who have not taken the vaccine. It could be because they can't go to the vaccine site. It, they may be worried whether it will adversely affect their underlying disease conditions. Maybe they believe that because they're at home, uh, they're safe. Then the myths about fertility, importance, inserting chips, or waiting for a better vaccines. These issues can only be addressed by public education. And if we look at the Sri Lanka's vaccine uh, program, it is one of the best in the world. The Sri Lankan childhood vaccination program is the best, if not the best. And none of the Western countries have the same similar coverage as Sri Lanka when it comes to childhood infectious diseases, nor do many other countries in our region. And Sri Lanka has been able to achieve this by proper communication and educating public because of our extremely good uh, primary care and public health service. And another aspect that has been ignored is mental health. Children are at home. They haven't gone to school for almost two years. University students are at home. People have lost their livelihood. People are isolated from their uh, loved ones. People are, are falling sick and when they go to hospital, their loved ones cannot visit them. So this is taking a huge toll on the mental health. If these are not addressed, acknowledged and addressed right now, they will have very long lasting consequences. So this is something important that needs to be addressed right now. And of course, COVID-19 won't last like this forever, although we will have ups and downs. So when we relax the restrictions, we should start tourism. All these two things should be done in a scientific manner. It should not be based on who makes the biggest noise or who knows who. So when we relax, everything should be based on science so that we don't have to go back and uh, start enforcing restrictions. And I think the most important thing the world has learned from this pandemic is countries might have military strength in the form of the best missiles, the best nuclear warheads, but they are useless when it comes to fighting with these invisible threats. So unless, and all countries we know, invest heavily on defense, building the best weapons and, and so on, and increasing military strength, but countries' uh, investment on science and technology has been limited. And because of that, we are susceptible for all these invisible threats. And when we look at the world history from the beginning, all, at all times, infectious diseases has caused more loss to life and the economies than all the world wars and other wars and terrorist attacks. So we should invest on science and technology. And if, if you look at the last 20 years, from 1980, 70 to 80% of emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases are from animal origin. So this One Health approach is extremely important with the deforestation, climate change, and unusual interactions uh, between humans and animals that did not exist earlier. More, more and more human uh, and animal viruses and pathogens will infect humans. So we need a One Health approach where we look after environmental health, animal health, in order to uh, look after human health. So we have to be prepared for these invisible threats, which are the deadliest. So finally, to end, we need to anticipate and act swiftly. We have to strengthen intelligence to rapidly be alert for new emerging variants and pathogens to take swift action. Vaccination is the solution, and that can only be done by proper public education. And if we are to move forward, empowering the public and community engagement is the key to success. So I would like to end by thanking all our funding organizations for their generous funding. And, I, and this is our team who have been working tirelessly. I know all of you know Dr. Kanchandi Mujiwandara, but all these individuals shown in this picture have been working day and night throughout weekends without a rest to do all this research and uh, other essays to make all this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. 
May I now call upon the treasurer of the Alumni Association, Mr. Janak Jaisekara, to propose the vote of thanks. Our guest speaker and orator, Professor Neelika Malavige, the Chancellor, Most Reverend Dr. Oswil Gomis, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna, the President of the Alumni Association, Mr. Rajiv Amarasuria, members of the Executive Committee of the Alumni Association, past orators of the Sujata Jayawardhan Memorial Oration, past presidents of the Alumni Association, members of the Council of the University of Colombo, the deans and the academic community of the University of Colombo and other universities, fellow members of the Alumni Association. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasant duty this evening to propose the vote of thanks at this Sujata Jayawardena Memorial Oration on behalf of the Alumni Association of the University of Colombo. At the very outset, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Professor Neelika Malavige, for accepting our invitation and delivering the 16th Sujata Jayawardena Memorial Oration today. This evening, Professor Malavige, a distinguished alumna of our university, very simply distilled her cutting edge internationally acclaimed research on the changing molecular structure of this unwelcome intruder, the SARS-CoV-2, and fed us some easily digestible capsules of scientific material. Professor Malavige, your lucidity of thought and clarity of expression amply demonstrated the scope and depth of your ongoing research, which will no doubt impact the lives of every citizen of our motherland. Thank you for your magnanimous contributions and suggestions to our country, and for so willingly abandoning your, pre your precious laboratory responsibilities and sharing some of your success with us this evening. We thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna, for her presence this evening and for being very supportive of the activities of the association and also for being a source of inspiration to us. Special thanks goes out to our past presidents, Mr. Tilak Karunaratna and Mrs. Ramani Amarasurya, for once again providing the necessary leadership in organizing of this oration. Your support and commitment are greatly appreciated. The members of the University of Colombo Network Operating Center and Ms. Anne Devananda, attorney at law, coordinated this virtual oration with a record participation of over 1,000 guests. We extend to them our sincere thanks for successfully accomplishing a difficult task. We also thank the media, both print and electronic, for the generous publicity they provided for this oration. We also thank our corporate partners, LOLC, the Aqua Group, TCS, and KWA Architects for their invaluable and continuing support for all our activities. Ms. Ruandi Tantrige, the Secretary of the Association, managed and coordinated the proceedings of this oration today. Thank you, Ms. Tantrige. We also thank all the deans, professors, and the academic staff for their presence today. One of the primary objectives of our association is to encourage, foster, and promote close relations between the university and its alumni, and amongst the alumni themselves. I convey a special thank you to our alumni for their participation and support. Before I conclude, let me thank all of you who are participating virtually through Zoom and Facebook Live for being present this evening. We look forward to your continued participation at all our events in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Janek. The oration has now come to a close. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to connecting with you again on future occasions. We wish you all a pleasant evening 
energy to stay safe during this time. Thank you.